Last time we looked at understanding the glory of God. And today, I'm going to go a little bit further and we're going to look at getting the glory of God. Got just two scriptures to read. John chapter 2 and verse 11. The first in a series of miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed in him. And then John chapter 11 and verse 40, Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Whew. We saw that the glory is God's power contained in light and sometimes, most of the time, it's actually hidden in a cloud. But God's glory is available to us through Jesus. He is the one who manifests the glory of God to us. And when that glory comes upon us, it takes away all the darkness from us and it gives us power and ability to do amazing things. I want to look at some of the things that the glory does before we look at how to go about getting it, because that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? By the time I'm finished, I hope you're saying, I want it, I want it, I want it. Where do I get it? How do I get more of it? See. The ability, the, the, the glory has the ability tra to transform us, to change us into something we weren't before. I want to show you three characters from the New Testament where this happened. And our key model is always Jesus. Jesus did no miracle or healing for the first 30 years of his life. Now, Jesus, originally, when he came from heaven, was bathed in the glory of the Father. Jesus, just before he went to the cross, in John chapter 17, as he prays to the Father, he says, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. The scripture says Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant. He came as a man. Give us a model. Jesus needed to receive the anointing and the glory before he could carry out any of his ministry. And we know how it happened. He came to John to be baptized in the River Jordan. And as he came out of the Jordan, the heavens opened up. And the glory of God came down. And the dove of the Holy Spirit came down and landed on him and stayed. And after that, Jesus did amazing things. Because he had the glory upon him. And we see there in that first verse we looked at, the very first miracle that Jesus performed at Cana of Galilee, it says he manifested his glory. That's how he performed the miracle. Let's look at the apostle Peter. He was weak. And unstable as the wind. <laughs> uh, one moment he was going to conquer the world, and the next moment he was denying his Lord three times. Oh, lots of potential, Peter, but so unstable, so weak, so incapable of following through. And then on the day of Pentecost, as the power comes down, as the glory of God comes down in fire and rests upon them, Peter is transformed. Peter suddenly becomes as bold as a lion. He stands up amongst all those people and boldly proclaims the gospel. And 3,000 people get saved. Wow. Oh, what made the difference? The glory. After that, Peter walked down the street. And people just got in his shadow and they got healed. But he couldn't do that before. Jesus had given them authority over sickness. They could do it as disciples. But when the glory came, 
so much more powerful, so much more awesome. While Peter's speaking to Cornelius' household, the Gentiles, the glory manifests and the power of God falls on the Gentiles. Peter doesn't even get to finish his sermon. They all start speaking in tongues. Wow. Can you imagine? You know, if the, if the cloud of God's glory falls while I'm preaching and you guys all start going to Kira and doing all sorts of weird things, don't worry about it. I'll let you do it. He doesn't often do it, but it's been known to happen. Because that's what happens when his glory comes. Let's look at Paul. Paul, he thought his calling in life was to kill Christians. And he was doing a pretty good job of it. Dashing there on his way to Damascus to go and get all of these Christians. (laughs) But he wasn't counting on meeting the glory. Because as he rode, the glory of God appeared. (laughs) And the light of the radiance of the glory shone down on him and knocked him to the ground. And this great big strong man sat there quivering. Who are you, Lord? Paul was never the same after he met the glory. And later on, as he walked in that glory, that glory began to radiate from him. People were put pieces of clothing on him and they would take it out to those who were sick and, and, and bound with demons. And man, the power of God was manifest. Just like what happened with Jesus when they came and touched his clothes, they got healed. It was the same glory. The snake tied itself around Paul's arm. <laughs> but the glory... The glory made him impervious to anything. He just shook it off into the fire like that. Ah, these are some of the effects, folks, that take place when we get the glory of God. Now, we have been training the fivefold ministry for some time now. It all began some years ago when we were in Mexico. And the Lord gave me a vision of this huge person lying on the ground, all covered in dirt and kind of tied down. And he said to me, this sleeping giant is my church. It's my body. He said, it's powerless, it's filthy, it's corroded, it's incapable of doing anything. He said, I'm calling you to wake the sleeping giants, to wake him up, to go and wake up the body of Christ, that they'll shake off all the muck that's covered them for so long and stand up and be what I've called them to be. As I continued to follow that vision, a while later I got another vision the one night as I was praying and I saw this huge person, like a giant. I thought, is is this Goliath? (laughs) Is this a demon power? Is this this some prince of the air that I need to come into warfare with? Kind of probably felt a bit like Joshua did when he saw the angel standing with his sword, and he said, are you for us or against us? Because if you're against us, I'm going to kill you. I said, Lord, who is this? He said, this is my mighty warrior. He said, the sleeping giants will arise and will stand and come against this world and the evil in this world and the powers of darkness, and he will stand tall and clothed in armor, and in might, and in power, and weapons in his hand, and he will go and do warfare. The Lord said to me, your job is to equip mighty warrior. The whole job is to make the mighty warrior capable and ready to go and do art, go out and do what I've called her to do. So I began our mandate to train. 
the leadership. Well, we kind of started with the head because that's where the fivefold are. <laughs> and for a long time, that's all we worked on was the apostles and the prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers kind of came afterwards. And we made a pretty good head. We made a pretty good helmet. And we just kind of majored in the apostles and prophets and the Lord said, the body's more than a head. There's more. He said, you need to start moving into the other ministries now too. So when God brought us to South Africa, he began to take us more into some of the other fivefold ministries and to expand our mandate and give us what we needed to give to the body of Christ, to equip them to go out and reign in this world and to overcome. And we've done a pretty effective job, I think, so far. Those that we've worked with. Recently, the Lord said to me, you finish that job, hand it over to somebody else, and I'm going to take you further. Well, how much further can you get than that? <laughs> Last night as we were in prayer, as I was preparing for today, I again saw the mighty warrior, and he was magnificent. He was clothed in his armor, and he had his weapons. I thought, Lord, we've done a pretty good job. I'm happy with what you've given us. I'm happy with what we're giving to your people. And the Lord said, it's not enough. I said, huh? He said, there's something missing. He said, yes. Mighty warrior is equipped, fully closed, with weapons in his hand. He said, but he lacks power. He needs glory. He needs the power of my spirit to enable him to use those weapons. And I saw as the glory of God began to come down on the mighty warrior. And he started to glow like fire. I saw his sword became a fiery sword. Woo! Now that was a fearsome sight. That was a fearsome sight. For me, the Lord said, that's your next mandate. He said, you've equipped the mighty warrior. Now you must clothe him in my glory. And so I'm teaching on the glory of God. And you're going to be hearing a lot of it in the next while because this is my new mandate. I'll give you a preview of what's about to come. A little down the line. There's another school coming. It's going to be called the School of the Spirit. Or the School of Glory. I don't know what we're going to call it. But it's going to be for everybody. Not just for the apostles or the prophets or the evangelists. It's going to be for every believer because that is the mighty warrior is the body of Christ. Every single one of the fivefold, they need the glory of God. Prophets need the glory of God. When we first started our teaching on the prophetic, we took Elijah and Elisha as models. Those of you who've been through our prophetic training, you know how we've taught that Elijah is the more senior training prophet. Elisha is the mentored or discipled prophet. And we really taught our prophets how to flow in the internal anointing. I'm going to be speaking a bit more about the internal anointing shortly. We taught our prophets how to tap into that power that was in them to get words of revelation to speak the word of God into the earth. Oh, we left one little thing out. Elijah and Elisha did far more than speak prophetic words and decrees. They performed miracles, signs, and healings, and all sorts of things. For the longest time, we've discussed this and felt there's something missing from our prophetic training. Our prophets need more. 
Well, I justified at the beginning. I said, well, you know, those things are for the evangelist, you know, moving in the power gifts and the signs and wonders. That's, that's really more of what an evangelist does. Uh, the prophet doesn't need to do that. <laughs> but I had this nagging thing. A kid coming up, what about Elijah? And Elisha. I know Nadine's been nagging me about this, and as she's taken over the training, she's already started to move in that direction. And now God has confirmed it again with what he's showing me, that we need to empower and teach the fivefold ministry how to move to the glory of God. Other prophets are going to move to a new level. Apostles need the glory. The Lord showed me when I first went through apostolic training uh, up to the highest level that just as the prophet has a key, golden key for ministry, a silver key for business, the apostle also has a key. And the Lord showed me that key in the spirit, and that key was covered with, with jewels, kind of like diamonds glistening. So you couldn't see the gold. You could just see these glistening jewels. And he said the jewel-encrusted key operates at a higher level than the golden key of the prophet. It can do the same thing but with greater authority and greater power. Also takes greater preparation and training and more death. So I used to hand this key out to people as part of their training, thinking, hey, this is awesome. I can take them to the next level. And they started to go through death like I'd never seen before. They would just vanish. Nobody followed through. They just vanish. I had to to get this key myself first. Now I realized why they vanished, because it's a very big price to pay. The Lord moved me into the business mandate. He showed me there's a business apostle. Well, the prophet has a golden key and a silver key. So... What does the apostle have? A golden encrusted and a silver encrusted. You can't tell the difference because you can't see the silver or the gold. All you see is the jewels. I said, Lord, what does the apostle to business have as a key? And he showed me an anchor. He said, because the ships of Tarshish are the symbol of business, and a ship is a symbol of business in the scriptures. He said, the Apostle to business has a jewel-encrusted anchor. Oh, that was exciting. As a whole new authority, a new level of anointing. And we stayed there for a while, and there was nothing more. And as God began to move me now to add this external dimension, which I'd left out. I'd have been there, we've operated in the gifts, we've prayed for the sick, We've seen God do some great things, but it was never an emphasis. I said, Lord, what do you give the apostle so that they can move the gift of healing? And you know what he showed me? You know the symbol that Moses put in the wilderness? He took a, st a stick and he put a brass snake around it. It's used in the medical uh, profession as a symbol he showed me a jewel encrusted snake on a stick. <laughs> he said, there's a new anointing, a new authority, a new power. He said, you haven't even trained any of my apostles to flow in it. I said, well, Lord, let me learn first. Because <laughs> everything we've ever taught, we've had to live first. Well, the apostle has more than that. The apostle has a crown and a, and a royal robe. And the scepter, well, the scepter's already got jewels on. The night as I was praying and entering into the glory of the Lord, he said to me, I want you to move to a higher apostolic level. He said, I'm giving you a new crown and a new robe. Well, I've had a few of these before because there's many different kinds of apostles and they all have different crowns and robes. But this was very different. The crown already had quite a lot of jewels in it just had a few more. And then he put this robe on me. 
<gasps> and I looked. And it was covered with diamonds. It was almost like made out of diamonds. It was shining. Man, it was so bright it almost blinded you. <sighs> when you put it on me, I felt, <laughs> this is heavy. This is raw power. He said the apostles must move at an even higher level. They must carry a far greater anointing. They should be the ones who carry my glory. I said, bring it on, Lord. <laughs> bring it on. If I have to die some more, that's fine. Here I go. If to end up, I'd end across. But I want it. I want it. I want everything you have to give. I want more and more. What about the teachers? Do teachers need the glory? Hmm? You know, we always think a teacher is just somebody that imparts knowledge. Well, Jesus taught with the glory, and it had an effect. In Luke 24, 32, after he had arisen from the dead and he was walking with some of the disciples in the road to Emmaus, they didn't realize it was him. And afterwards, they realized who it was. It says, and they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us? While he was talking with us along the way. And while he opened to us the scriptures. The glory was there even in his teaching. So much so that when he stood up to speak, they said he speaks with authority and not like the scribes. They sent people to arrest him. They said, nobody ever spoke like this before. He was manifesting the glory even in his teaching. Oh, there's a challenge for the teachers. You don't have to just be in the word. You can manifest the glory and the power of God even in your teaching. It can affect lives. Oh, we know the evangelist moves in this anyway because it's part of the external anointing, the signs and wonders that accompany the preaching of the gospel. Pastors also need it to empower the sheep. Every one of the fivefold needs the glory of God. Now, what does the glory have? It makes it so powerful and necessary for us to have more of it. I discovered a phrase in the scriptures that I'd never fully taken into account. It's the term riches in glory. Well, you know, I always figured glory is the realm of God, which is heaven. And I know that that scripture says God shall provide our needs according to his riches and glory. And we'll look at that shortly. But I discovered there's a few other verses that use the same expression. Riches in glory, riches of glory. That word riches speaks of riches, wealth, valuable stuff. Kind of stuff you want to get more of and hold on to. And so I looked at some of these verses that speak of the riches of the glory of God to see what it is we can get from the glory. Ephesians 3.16 says this, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be made strong with the power of ability, which is dunamis. Power of authority is exousia. It's a different word. By his spirit in the inner man. The Bible calls that the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The glory comes upon you and enters you and strengthens the inner man and fills you up inside. And it creates a wonderful feeling, better than any drugs or alcohol in this world. Sometimes pretty close, just bitter. Whew. It's a high. You get in that glory cloud, sometimes you can't walk afterwards. People fall on the ground and can't get up. Some people can't speak English for a while. They just speak tongues. They're so caught up in the glory of the Lord because it so overwhelms you. 
let you know, drugs wear off. So does alcohol. You've got to go back and take some more if you want that nice feeling. Uh, but then you're suffering the after effects. <laughs> the Holy Ghost doesn't have any after effects. So well, should we be doing this? No? Am, am I becoming a glory junkie? Am I allowed to? Oh, you just look where God's moving in revival power. He was going to go and have people lay hands on them so they can fall on the ground 20 times and just experience the glory. I used to condemn them and say, you know what? Let's just never grow up. And then I discovered this scripture here, which says in Ephesians 5 verse 18, do not get continually drunk on wine, which leads to riotous excess, but rather continue to be filled with the Spirit. God is commanding you to get drunk. He's commanding you to get drunk all the time, continually. Continually be filled. It's a, it's a process of continually being filled over and over again. I, you know, I had a great time in 19... 19- 56, when the power of God came on me, and it was so awesome. I still remember that day. What do you mean, Nixon said? then? So I'd love to experience that again. You can. But how? Ah, see, that's what most people don't realize. They don't realize that not only is it available to you, God expects you to enter into it and experience it. He commands us to drink a lot all the time. You should continually be in a state of being filled. Can you imagine going into this world with the joy of being high? And I don't care what anybody thinks. I've got the glory. So you can say to me what you like. You can stick pins and needles in me. I don't care. I've got the Lord. I've got his glory and his power. And you know, wherever you go, darkness flees before you. Bam, bam, bam. Satan takes one look, turns tail and runs. Because you bathed in the glory of God. That's one of the benefits of the glory. It's one of the riches that are available to us from the glory of God. And then the glory also increases our capacity to get revelation. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. I shared that scripture last time. It's one of my favorites that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. That's one of the riches of the glory. You say, well, you know, I'd love to get better revelation as a prophet. Get in the glory. Your revelation capacity will increase many times. That glory will greatly enhance what you had on the inside. You see, these things are being given to us where? In the inner man, it says. You to be made strong with the power of his spirit in the inner man. Well, you know, I've got the internal anointing. I can tap into that. It's not enough. You need more. You need more. The glory boosts our knowledge of the power of the resident Christ so that we experience the power of his resurrection. Without that, you will not. And then, thirdly, it leads to financial prosperity. The verse I quoted earlier, Philippians 4.19, But my God will supply all your needs 
according to his riches in glory. To Christ Jesus. Well, Jesus, he used that glory. He said, guys, cast your nets on the other side of the boat. Wow, the biggest catch I've ever had. Peter said, Lord, do I have to pay the temple tax? Jesus said, go. Put your, put your hook in, Peter, and the first fish you pull up, open its mouth, will be money in it. Use that to go and pay the tax. See, Jesus used the glory to create financial provision. Well, you know, I always thought that glory was heaven. And yes, it is God's heavenly realm, but heaven isn't just up there. It's another realm. And so I've taught in the, in the way of blessing, the principle of transmutation, of bringing down from glory to be manifest in this earth. Everything that we desire from the Lord. Well, you need to get the glory first. And then you need to learn how to tap into that glory and to pull from it all the riches that are contained in it. Okay, the million-dollar question. How do I get glory? The glory comes from the presence of God because he is the God of glory. He lives in light and radiance and glory. The first time you experience the glory of God is when his spirit comes upon you to anoint you for service and experience that we like to call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now you can be saved and have quite a degree of the internal anointing and be aware of the Lord, but until you receive that empowerment from on high, the anointing of the Holy Spirit that comes upon you, that's the first time you actually begin to experience the glory of God. The question is, what kind of baptism did you have? The day you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what was it like? What kind of experience did you have? Was it a glorious one? For some people it's not. They say, well, you know, I've never experienced the glory. Well, are you filled with the Spirit? Yes. Well, then you've experienced the glory. Well, I didn't feel much. I just kind of babbled a few words in tongues. That was it. <laughs> uh, you know, some people, are, they, they got filled with the Spirit and spoke in tongues. It's the last time they spoke in tongues. You see, it happens like this. If you take this empty bottle with the lid off and you plunge it underwater, the outside of the bottle gets totally wet and saturated. Do you know what? The water starts to pour in until it fills the bottle. So the, the bottle now is filled with water on the inside and on the outside. That's what happens. That's what's supposed to happen with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It says on the day of Pentecost, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled. You know, we have this expression in charismatic and Pentecostal circles, are you spirit-filled? And you know, most of us have to say, yes, I was. <laughs> Because you're not be being filled all the time, like he said. You had it once, and that was great. Now it's over. Now it's time to throw the bottle in the water again. So, oh, yeah, I got a pretty, my bottle's still pretty full. I've got enough water to drink there. How much do you have to give out to others? You see, it's only when your bottle is filled to overflowing that you start pouring out. That's when ministry takes place. That's when the glory of God was in you and upon you begins to radiate out. And that's the 
purpose for it. That's the main purpose for it. Do you know that the glory contains all the spiritual gifts? So did you receive the glory? Oh, if you baptized the Holy Spirit, yes, you did. That was your first taste, your first touch of the glory of God. That's when the anointing came upon you. But you know the anointing isn't at one level. The anointing can be increased and enhanced and highly magnified. And because you were filled with the Spirit, could you now flow in all the nine gifts of the Spirit? <laughs> Could you? Trick question. I should rather say, do you? Are those gifts manifest in you since you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I think most of us are going to say, well, not really. Uh, I would like it to. I wish they would. Probably the only gift that manifested in most people is speaking in tongues. So the gift of tongues is probably the only one that ever manifested, and it seems to be the most common but not always. You see, I'm always an exception to the rule. Nothing that I teach you has been taught by anybody else because God took me a different route. I've not received any impartations of anointing that I can impart to you. If I impart something to you, it's original because I got it from the Lord. It's the pit sometimes. It'd be so easy just to have somebody else just lay their hands on me and zap. There you go. Phew. Wouldn't that be so nice? Uh, let me go to the front and fall out of the power a few times and get up in the glory. I, it was never my privilege. The Lord said, I'm giving you something unique. You're not going to get it from somewhere else. But you see, the glory contains all the gifts. The thing is, you need to know how to extract the gifts from the glory. We're probably going to be doing a lot of teaching on that in the future. But I'm just going to give you a, a brief introduction today. And then you manifest the glory. How did Jesus manifest the glory? Through the miracles that he performed. It says when he performed the miracle at Cana of Galilee, he manifested his glory and his disciples believed on him. Well, you manifest the glory through the gifts the Holy Spirit. That's how you do it. So if you've received the glory, the gifts are contained in it. You have to learn how to extract those gifts from the glory, and then you need to know how to use those gifts to now take that glory and pour it outwards and manifest it to others. We call that ministry. Ministry by the Spirit. Now I'm going to end just by sharing some of my personal experience. I've told a lot of my story before. Most of you may have heard it, but I'm going to try and crystallize it and bring it together to help you understand all of this concept. My initial baptism was transforming. I grew up a weak, insecure little wimp. I knew the scriptures. I knew the Lord all my life. But I had no boldness, no confidence. I was afraid to even close a meeting in prayer in a youth meeting one night when they asked me. I, was, I had nothing. I loved the Lord. I tried to witness because I was told that's what you're supposed to do as Christians, but I wasn't very good at it. Because I had no confidence, no boldness. But the night the Lord filled me with the Holy Spirit, something amazing, amazing took place. Wow, 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 wow. Man, the glory of God came down on me so strong. I tell you what, I was floating on cloud nine, you know, and I couldn't wait to get out there and use this. I remember straight after the youth uh, thing that we'd had, uh, the youth camp where, where I got filled, we got back into the church and they had the church prayer meeting. Don't you love church prayer meetings? Old people droning on and on with boring prayers that put you to sleep. We suffered through the prayer meeting. 
And when it was over, I got excited. I called to the young people. I said, hey. I, put, I brought a chair and I climbed on the chair and I opened my Bible and said, I'm going to preach to you. <laughs> this is the little wimp who wouldn't even open in prayer in a youth meeting before. Something miraculous took place. Oh, I just wanted more and more and more and more and more of this. I used to wait until the boring church meeting was over. I'd gather the young people. We'd go to somebody's home. We'd have our own prayer meeting. And if we could, we'd arrive at the church before the main boring meeting started, and we'd pray in the back and have the glory. I had to bring some of it in, and it didn't always help. We didn't know how to release it. <laughs> that I was full of the Spirit. The very first time I was full of the Spirit, I went to a little place where God was moving a few young people started to pray and the power of God came down and, and I stood there and I felt lifted up. But I didn't, wasn't aware that I was full of the Spirit. So the next night when they had the meeting, they said, anybody wants to be full of the Spirit, come forward and we'll pray for you. And I was up there first, boy. And they laid hands on me. And as they prayed for me, I felt like I was being lifted up. Ooh, lifted up into the clouds. And I had my hands up there. I felt this, like I'd taken hold of the mains. I felt this power coming. In fact, it was so strong, it was pulling my muscles in that I couldn't open my fingers. It was like, yeah. it hurt. It hurt. I've never experienced anything like that in my life before. I thought, wow, this is exciting stuff. I don't know what it is, but hey, it's got to be God. You know, up until then, you believe in the Lord by faith, but now you know because you can feel him. And you see, that's the difference with the glory. You feel the glory. You feel it. You don't just believe it by faith. You don't see it in your mind's eye. It's a tangible thing. It zaps you in the face. It goes all over you. It changes you. Well, I'll tell you what, I spend so much time in his presence I just wanted to pray. And then we started thinking about the gifts of the Spirit. I thought, oh, I'd love the Lord to use me in the gifts of the Spirit. I remember in our prayer meetings, there was a young girl who'd start to prophesy, give prophetic words. I thought, what? She's like 11 years old or something. Here's me, 22. Took me so long to get this. And she's prophesying. I'm the leader here. I can't prophesy. Just be told I couldn't even speak in tongues. I felt God's power. I couldn't speak in tongues. Everybody there was, I don't shout on my tool about a bottle of that. I'm, praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. It was horrible. You see, I received the glory. The gifts were there. I just didn't know how to extract them. One of those gifts was manifesting already. For most people, it's tongues. For me, it was this power that come in my hands. I thought, oh, I've got the gift of power. I'm sure if I lay my hands on you, that power is going to zap you. Who needs the baptism of the Spirit? Who needs to be filled? Let me lay hands on you. <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Can't be the power for the gift of the Spirit. Maybe it's healing. Anybody sick? Give me my hands on you. You feel better? No, I don't. Nothing. Come on, Lord, heal in the name of Jesus. Me, nah, zilch. Okay, it's not the gift of healing. <laughs> Took me a long time to discover it was actually a gift of discerning of spirits. What? I asked everybody about it. Nobody I'd ever knew. None of the pastors. Eventually they said, stop. Said to me, let's stop talking about this stupid thing because nobody works in, nobody operates in, a th in anything like that. You must be in deception. <laughs> God went around about it. I told you, I, I never follow the rules. He showed me he's a gift of discerning of spirits. Then, when I laid hands or came close to somebody who was demonized, the demon would set up a reaction in my hand and I would feel it. To this day, if I come near you and I, <laughs> and I feel that in my hand, I know you're under oppression. There's something demonic operating. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't tell you that. 
That was the only gift I had. I said, well, Lord, I want to speak in tongues. And I went forward for prayer so many times. I never got it. All the nine, ten-year-olds, five-year-olds were speaking in tongues. And I was the youth leader, and I couldn't speak in tongues. It was horrible. And again, I had to learn, you see. Until the Lord showed me, he said, you must reach out and take this. Just take it. But I struggled. Sometimes people say, if you just use a word over and over again. You know, I heard somebody say the word, Kura Vashanda. I thought, it sounds good. Kura Vashanda, Kura Vashanda, Kura Vashanda, Kura Vashanda, Kura Vashanda. Kura Vashanda. Kura Vashanda. <laughs> Nothing came. Nothing came. And the one day I was so frustrated. I went into my lounge and I said, okay, this is it. Lord, I want it and I want it now. Kura Vashanda, Kura Vashanda. Nothing. Well, the more I prayed and the more I struggled, I came to the conclusion, perhaps I've got sin in my life. And that's why God doesn't want to give it to me. You know, I've been using my mouth to criticize and say negative things about people. Why God won't give me tongues. That's what it is. I've got to get my life right. Lord, show me where the sin is in my life. Well, I I couldn't get prophetic revelation those days, so God said to me, open your Bible. It never works for me normal. Open your Bible and stick your finger on a, on a scripture. That day it worked. Open the scripture, I think, in Galatians, which said, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? As he may be in the eyes. So thank you, Lord, I want another one. <laughs> he was gracious. It was close related. It said, he that ministers the Spirit and does miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The Lord was saying, you will never be good enough to get this. You're going to have to get it by faith. What's faith? I hadn't learned what faith was. So in my mind, I thought, what is faith? I try faith, faith, faith. And in my mind, I felt myself just reaching out like this and saying, Oh, Lord, I'm taking it now by faith. Go to Bashandala, my sick, a terrible. You know, there was something extra there. My tongues. I began to speak as fast as I could, and my poor, my, my poor tongue couldn't keep up. I thought, I couldn't have made that up. I couldn't do that before. As I did it, I began to feel something. I began to feel his power coming down in me. And I said, Lord, this is you. But confirm it to me. Give me a tongue I can understand. I want an African click language. And so I began to speak. I'd never, ever been able to use clicks before in my life. I tried to study Zulu once and it was a struggle. I can speak Zulu now since I spoke in tongues because I know how to do the clicks. So the Holy Spirit showed me how to do it. Well, I got it. And I said, Lord, I'll use it every day now. Tell you what, so many Christians, they spoke in tongues the day they got baptized the Holy Spirit. And every now and then, when they feel a bit of anointing on them and they feel good, then they speak in tongues a little bit. I said, Lord, I'm going to speak in tongues every day of my life. I'm going to speak in tongues when I get up in the morning. I'm going to speak in tongues during the day. I'm going to speak in tongues while I'm driving the car. I'm going to speak in tongues under my breath while I'm at work. Well, that led to a whole lot more. I found out that in doing that, I could tap into something more. And we've taught you some of that, and we'll teach you more on that. But now I could speak in tongues. Truth be told, I made sure I spoke in tongues every day in case it didn't work anymore. <laughs> Let me try. First thing in the morning, can I still speak in tongues? I didn't want to lose it. Yeah. I hear these people, they just get zapped with the Holy Spirit and they speak in tongues. Yeah. 
don't know how powerful tongues is. What an important gift it is. But after that, I needed to prophesy. And I couldn't prophesy. And eventually, I went into ministry. And they gave me a church. And people started to give utterances in tongues in the meeting. And I waited for who's going to have the interpretation. <laughs> because I couldn't prophesy. I couldn't interpret. Somebody said to me, the one day you're the pastor. People are expecting you to interpret. I said, I don't know how to do that. I found out I had to tap into that glory now and extract the gifts. I had to extract the gift of tongues, of interpretation of tongues. I had to extract the gift of prophecy. But you know what set me right and gave me the faith to reach out to the Lord for tongues? Just one little scripture where Paul said, I want you all to speak in tongues. I said, well, if that's all that includes me, God has not left me out and given to everybody else. He wants all of us to speak in tongues. Therefore, I take my stand in faith on the word. Lord, you said all of us speak in tongues, so I'm going to speak in tongues. And I did. Shortly afterwards, I found a scripture that says, for you may all prophesy. I said, I'm going to prophesy now. I said, everybody, you watch one of these days, I'm going to prophesy. And sure as that's one of those days when I least expected it, I was praying with somebody and the Lord said, no, you prophesy. Prophesy. And out it came. Wow. Wow. I read the scripture says, he that prays in tongues should interpret his tongue. God says, if I, if I can speak in tongues, I should be able to interpret. Well, how do I interpret my tongues? So I practiced. I spoke in tongues, and then I spoke in English, and I spoke in tongues, and I spoke in English. Until eventually I came to the place where I felt, as I spoke in English, I felt the anointing, and I felt God was confirming to me that I was actually interpreting. I spoke in tongues. Until the time came. Somebody gave an utterance in a meeting and I launched out into the deep and I gave the interpretation. And after that, I could flow with the gifts of interpretation. See, none of these things came automatic. And you know what? Like a child learns to speak and walk. You don't come full blown. It took me a long time to learn how to use these gifts. Even once I'd entered into them. You've got to develop it like exercising a muscle until it gets better. And once you've learned that, you can tap into the glory anytime and release that glory via those gifts of the Spirit. Well, that was great. I could prophesy. I could speak in tongues. I could interpret. What about the other gifts? <laughs> what about healing? Well, you know, I don't know if God wants to use me in healing. I'd love him to. Lord, please, I would love to have the gift of healing. But, you know, I don't know whether it's your. I see that you do use some people in healing, but not me. How do I know? It's your will. But I found out how to go the same way I did for tongues and for interpretation and prophecy. How to find a promise in the word on which to base my faith. Because you see, it always comes by faith, and faith comes by hearing the word of God. And this scripture jumped out at me, been staring at me all along. I never noticed it. Mark 16, verse 17 onwards. And these miraculous signs shall accompany those that have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues. It will take up serpents if they drink any deadly thing and will not harm them. They will lay hands on sick people and they will become well. These signs shall follow who? Those whom God has chosen. Those whom God has called. Those who believe. I said, that's me. For you may all. That's me. I'm all. But those who believe. That's me. I'm a believer. I have a right. I have something on which to base my faith. I'm going to reach out and I'm going to take it. And so it is for all the gifts. Now it's true, God 
uses some of these gifts more amongst different ones of the fivefold. They are very characteristic of the evangelist, but everybody can move in them. And certainly when we get into the prophetic and the apostolic level, if a little evangelist at the bottom can do it, why can't we? Well, you know, God's called me to be a prophet. He gives me a revelation. I've learned how to prophesy. But you know, not many people have come to us for prophetic training knew how to prophesy. We even know how to teach them that. So we're going to teach you how to tap into the external next. <laughs> we're going to show you how to extract those gifts from the glory, because you already have been a partaker of the glory. All of these things come by faith. Jesus said, did I not say, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And Lord, I want to see your glory. He says, believe and you will see my glory. Our believing in faith are the same thing. And well, I needed to learn a bit about faith. I went to the favorite passage of scripture that Kenneth Hagin, the master of faith, used as his foundation. Mark chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. And I love those verses and I memorized them. But as I began to look deeper in the Greek, I said, Lord, there's got to be more in there that I haven't uncovered yet. I want to retranslate these to bring out the full meaning of them. And I believe he's given me an interpretation. I believe my interpretation is accurate to the Greek, but it's a bit different to what you've normally heard these verses. So I'm going to read you the GBM translation. Mark 11, 23. Let me tell you something. Jesus is always saying, verily, verily, I say unto thee. He was saying, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Any person, any person who says to this mountain, be removed and be thrown into the sea and does not waver in doubt in his heart, but is fully persuaded that those things that he is saying are happening for him, he will have whatever he says. And then the next one actually shows you how. Because of this, I'm telling you, no matter what you are asking for yourself, see, the Greek there doesn't say, the original says, whatsoever you ask in prayer. That word ask means to ask for yourself. It's actually a, a very special Greek construction called the middle voice. So you're not just asking, you're asking for me. So when you come to him in prayer to ask him for something for yourself, that's what is applying here. Okay. No matter what you are asking for, no matter, there's no conditions. While you are praying, the original says believe that you have received them. That word believe has several different meanings. One of the most powerful ones is to commit yourself. That word receiving is a very distinct word. You know, we often seem to think of receiving as yeah, somebody gave me something and I received it. That, that word receive actually means to reach out and lay hold of. So I've translated it this way. No matter what you are asking for yourself, while you are praying, commit yourself to taking it. And it'll happen. That's a bit bold. That's a bit arrogant. No. No. He's saying, while you're praying, make a commitment. Lord, I'm going to take this thing because you've promised it to me in your word. I believe it's mine. I'm going to reach out. That first day when I reached out and got tongues, I could see that the, like this hand. I thought, I could reach up with my hand of faith. And I saw me sticking this hand into the heavenly realm, grabbing what I want, putting it down. That's what faith is, quite simply. And if you can find a promise in the word and you know that you know that you know that God wants you to have this, Stop waiting for him to give it to you. 
you hold out a gift to one of your little kids. Are well, they going to stand there and say, mm, I wish I could have that. I tell you what, they've snatched that and the wrapping's gone before you know it. Eh? We need to get like that about God's glory and his power and the gifts of the spirit that he's given to us. Amen. Without glory, we are powerless. That glory is available to every single one of us. But you must really want it. You must really desire it. The scripture says, earnestly desire spiritual gifts and follow after love. Earnestly, passionately, to the point where you're nagging. Otherwise, the Lord's going to say, well, obviously you don't really want it. It's standing here, but nobody's taken it yet. Reach out that arm of faith and take it. He's not going to hold it from you. You must know that you have a right to it. When you know that, it's a simple matter of saying, thank you, Lord. I take it. See, that's what receiving means. I reach out and I lay hold on it with my hand. Where do you stand today? Have you experienced the glory of God? Did you have an ecstatic experience back there when you were first filled with the Holy Spirit? Or have you had any experiences along the way where you felt the touch of God, where you got a touch of his glory? Perhaps you said, I wish I could go back there again. You know, I remember that time in our first church when God was really working. Things were really happening. Oh, bring back those happy days, Lord. I wish we could go back there again. It's like the children of Israel and they're saying, you know, we heard all the good things that our fathers told us about the miracles God did, but where are they now? We sit and wait and hope that God will give it to us when he feels like it. Or perhaps we hear of somebody who tapped into it and is flowing in it and is starting to manifest in their ministry and is starting to manifest in their church or in their gathering. People start to flock there to get a touch of the glory cloud, to get a taste. You don't have to wait for somebody else to tap into the glory before you can get it. You have the right to tap into that because it's the same glory. It's the same God. It's the same Holy Spirit. And he's available to you. Oh, you may need to take a bit of time to spend with him. Instead of running around saying, I'm too busy. You may need to spend long periods praying in tongues and praying in the spirit and seeking God and learning to exercise this muscle here. Practice it. Till you tap into the glory, reach out and extract from that glory the gifts of the Spirit that you are earnestly desiring. He's happy to give you all nine of them. There's no restriction. And then you know what's going to happen when you come into the meeting? You're going to bring it with you. You know when the glory cloud most often appears in a meeting? Is when you have what they call the corporate anointing. It's when everybody there brings their little piece and adds it. Sometimes it's formed through praise and worship. It's like sending up vapors into the air. You see now the clouds form? On a hot day, you see the the water being drawn up like that. And the cumulus clouds start to form. And after a while, they start to get black. And it's time for the rain to come. Well, don't wait for the rain clouds. Make your own. Tap into that glory. Do it by praying in the spirit. You're doing by praising. A lady that was used by the Lord a while back, she's dead now. A woman by the name of Ruth Ward Heflin. She majored on teaching on the glory. And she had this little saying. She said, you need to pray 
until the spirit of praise comes. She said, and then you must praise until the glory comes. And when the glory comes, just stand in the glory. Stand in the glory. You know, we give up too soon. We pray for five minutes and nothing's happened. And we wonder, oh, God doesn't want to give it to me. You know, maybe you need to spend a bit more time praying and then start to praise and worship. I find I just pick up my guitar and I strum a couple of chords and he's there. He's there. And it doesn't take long and I see the radiance. And the, sometimes I see that cloud coming over or the lightning coming out of it. And I say, let me get in that cloud. And everything goes very hazy. I can do it all by myself. I can even do it in a group. This is all available to you. We're going to be teaching you more on this. We're going to be showing you that you can have it, that you should have it, until your faith is built up to the point, until your desire is so red hot that you're saying, I want it, and I want it now. I don't care what it's going to cost me. I don't care what price it is. I want it, and I want it now. And the Lord's going to say, I was waiting for that. Yeah, sometimes we ask the Lord for something and if we feel like he says no. I've learned not to leave it at that. And then, Lord, I want this. And he says, well, you know, not, not right now. Uh, Lord, I said I want it. You know, when I started out singing and worshipping, my voice was terrible. I thought it sounded great and everybody was cringing in it. I'd start singing and I'd see the people start to cringe and I think, I thought I was doing pretty good. Started to buy courses on singing and see if I could learn something. And I, and I just cried. I said, Lord, it's not fair. People are born with a beautiful voice and they don't even serve you. And yeah, I want to serve you. And I want to use my voice for you. And you can't let me sing. <laughs> the Lord said, I didn't call you to be a singer. You know what I said to him? I don't care. I said, I don't care. I want to sing. And I'm going to nag you until you give it to me. Oh, yeah, no, I don't, don't have a professional voice here, but I'm not ashamed to sing in public anymore. What is it that you're so earnestly desiring from the Lord? He will withhold nothing from you. But you know what? Get into his glory. Get into his glory. Get into his presence and in his power. And you know, when you come into his presence, he's going to come and say to you, is there anything you want? Can I do something for you? Can I bless you to show you how much I love you? He's going to withhold nothing from you. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your glory. I thank you for each one here today. <clears throat> and I know you've placed in their hearts a desire for more, more of your glory and of your power to be used by you, to get back to some of the experiences we had in the past and even beyond and more, Lord. I'm asking you especially to manifest your glory in this place and amongst everybody who hears this word right now that you will take these words that I've spoken and that you will anoint them with your glory and that as people hear it, your glory will come upon them. Your power will hit them, Lord. And they'll be filled with the Spirit and they'll feel your anointing and their lives will be transformed because that's the power of your word. Thank you for it, Jesus. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you that your glory is here right now. Your presence is now upon each one of us, Lord. And as you move upon each one of us now, we want to reach out to you. We want to reach out and say, Lord, I want more. I want more. I want to feel more of your power. Lord, I want to get on a bigger high than I've ever experienced in any substance in this world. And I want to know that it's you. I want to be filled with your joy. I want to move in your spirit. I want to be used by you. I want to flow in the gifts of the spirit. Hallelujah.
Practice reaching out that arm of faith. Get into the scriptures. Find those promises. Speak those promises over and over and over again out loud until you start to believe them. Then pray in tongues for a bit and then speak them some more until you feel the charge beginning to build up inside of you. Reach out with that arm of faith. Right up into the heavenly realm. Say, Lord, I'm taking it now. This is mine. I receive it with gratitude and thanks. I take it, Lord. It's mine. God's doing something right now amongst some of you. Even now, as you've been reaching out with desire, he says, I see your desire. And I want to fulfill that desire. I want to give you what you desire even more than what you desire it, my child. I will withhold nothing from you. Nothing at all. You can never get enough of my glory. I will never say to you, enough now, take a break. I will continue to pour more and more and more into you. But eventually you begin to cry and say, okay, Lord, I can't take any more. Hallelujah. Thank you for your manifest presence. Thank you, Father, for those that are watching this now, that you'll reach out and touch them. Stir them up. Show them how to reach in and tap into this now. Hallelujah. We give you the praise. We give you the honor. We stand in your glory. And then we take it out into this world. We shine that light in the darkness. We dispel the darkness. We bring the lost to you, Lord. We set the captives free. Even as you said, and the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good news. Oh, Lord, may you empower us to go out and preach the good news, Lord. Set people free. Hallelujah. Thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.